All right, let's uh, take each of these and talk a little bit further about each, uh, them uh, separately and then see how this uh, works out for behaviorist account of, of psychology here. Let's take this issue of, uh, of observation. Uh, I want to uh, first tell a story that comes from a philosopher, uh, Antony Flew, who had uh, some behaviorist leanings at, at various points in his, uh, his intellectual career. But it's a kind of anecdote that uh, behaviorists uh, will use regularly to kind of test right, whether people are actually committed to observation or whether uh, they are, uh, in some sense, just going through the motions of being scientific, but really they have a pre-scientific uh, commitment to a, a non-observational uh, 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 or non-scientific way of understanding things. The anecdote that Flew tells uh, involves two jungle explorers. He just asks us to imagine two, uh, two guys who've been out, I believe it was somewhere in Africa, and they've been tramping around for, for months without seeing anybody, and then they come to this clearing, and they both stop, and they're admiring the beauty of this clearing, uh, and uh, what they notice is, and here my years of art school training will come in handy, is that there's a, a stream kind of running through here, and uh, the stream is kind of spilled over a little bit at this area here, so it's a marshy area. And what we have growing in this marshy area are some plants that are kind of marsh-loving plants. Uh, there's a slight rise up over here, and up here things are quite dry and exposed pretty regularly to the sun. What we have up here are some, uh, we'll say, some kind of spiky-looking plants that are quite uh, quite lovely in their own way, but nonetheless, they need a lot of sun and they're, they don't need a, a great deal of water. Over here, uh, we'll say there are some uh, very tall trees. Uh, these tall trees generate a great deal of shade. And then what we have down here, growing at the base of them again, are some, some plants. And I'll draw some fairly broad leaf type of plants down here. Uh, that are, are shade-loving plants and shade-needing plants, and they're not able to, uh, to tolerate uh, a great deal of direct sunlight. All right, uh, and of course, it's more complicated than this. This is just very rudimentary here. But what we have from the two explorers is when they're looking at this, uh, this wonderful clearing, uh, remarking upon its beauties, one of them exclaims, who would have thought that there would be a garden way out here in the, in the middle of the jungle? Right? And the second one says, a garden? Why do you think it's a garden? And the guy says, well, look how beautifully everything is, is organized uh, and how all of the plants have been arranged and uh, located in positions where they can get exactly what they need. All of the plants that need a great deal of water are down in the marshy area. The plants that need a lot of sun but not a lot of water, all of them are arranged up here. And the plants that cannot tolerate a great deal of sunlight, they are uh, over here in the shade just where they need to be. Clearly, given the organization and complexity of this structure here, it's a garden. And so there must be someone who uh, planted and tended this garden, uh, a gardener, right, who, uh, who's for some strange reason uh, created this garden out here in the middle of the jungle. The second explorer is uh, much more skeptical and says, uh, garden, gardener, there's no uh, garden or gardener here. Instead, what we have is a natural evolutionary process. Right? We have uh, uh, these plants here because last year, the previous generation of those plants went to seed. Some of the seeds were scattered by the wind up here. Some of them were scattered there. Some of them, of course, fell in this marshy area right here. And what happened was the, the seeds that were blown up to this area here, they got baked in the sun. They didn't get enough moisture, and so they just didn't make it. The ones that blew over here uh, didn't get enough sun, so they didn't make it. So only the ones that uh, were blown by the wind, by the, the random processes of the wind, and ended up in this area got uh, established in exactly the right conditions and grew here. And so that's why all of those plants are where they are. And the same kind of a story can be told for these ones here. These seeds went to, or the plants went to seed, and only the seeds that ended up in, in the right kind of conditions up here made it. The ones that were blown down over here, they didn't make it, right, and so on. So there's no garden. There's no gardener. Instead, what we have is a complex uh, array of organisms uh, having evolved by purely naturalistic forces. All right, so what we have here in Antony Flew's story is a scaled-down version or an allegorical version of the argument from design, right, where the one side is arguing, giving the complexity of certain kinds of natural phenomena. There must be an intelligent orderer behind it, and the other arguing that complex natural phenomena can evolve through uh, uh, unintelligent processes that are purely naturalistic here.